Election season is in full swing in Manitoba. Advanced polling is open until September 30th, with election day for the 43rd general provincial election on October 3rd. But who are the people who may be running the province for the next four years? We invited all of Manitoba's political parties to U Radio to find out. Well, I'm Janine Gibson. I'm the leader of the Green Party of Manitoba. This is a new position I assumed in March, so we're just putting together our green team. I'm very pleased with the team that we've got together that we're, we're working on. In addition to being the leader of the Green Party, I'm also the Wolseley candidate, and we have a history of strong support in Wolseley, so we're really hoping the people of Wolseley know that our Manitoba government needs a strong voice to talk about the climate emergency that we're in and the actions that we need to take. So that's how I come to be here before you today. Thank you. I, it, we very appreciate you coming down, talking with us, letting our listeners and other constituents know a little bit about the, the different parties who are going to be leading the province for the next four years. So why did you want to get involved in politics? I've been an environmental activist my whole life. When I was 12, 11, 12 years old, my dad brought Rachel Carson's Silent Spring into the household. Now that'll speak to a certain age level of your listeners. Others might not uh, know that, that uh, tome. So for a more modern version of basically a similar message, except now with the climate emergency focused, the last book I read was um, Seth Klein's A Good War that really talks and inspires our green philosophy and values to mobilize youth and mobilize our whole community to address the climate emergency that we're in. So start Starting from as a young one, reading A Silent Spring, loving the birds, loving watching the birds, loving being in nature, having the privilege to have spent most of my life living on the land. And that connection has been very nourishing and strengthening for me that um, I felt frustrated in government was not listening to the activists about the basics of protecting our water, uh, ensuring that we have safe, warm housing, you know, the basics, housing, local food for local consumption, like th those are the things we need, shelter, food, and water, and hopefully transportation and you know that is not even being managed very well so I thought okay when I was asked would you consider leading the Green Party at first I thought oh I'm so busy and then I thought well what I'm busy doing are, are trying to implement the policies of the Green Party so yes I should be in this position because that's what so much of my life is about trying to support local producers for local food consumption organic food consumption more resilient food produ consumption production than this industrial model that is very geared for trade. It's not geared for local people, and it's causing great greenhouse gas emissions. So I thought, okay, I have a role to play. I'm going to see if the people of Wolseley are ready for me for, to have a green MLA, because I don't see much difference between the dominant parties. They're both very inactive in terms of dealing with a climate emergency, in terms of preparing for the housing that we will need because there are going to be increased climate refugees with the kinds of, of weather disasters and extreme weather events that are happening, we need to be prepared to house and care for more folks here in Manitoba. And we already know what kind of housing crisis we're in. So I wanted to work with the Green Party because I believe we have a lot of very forward thinking, intelligent, well thought out policies that I believe the people of Manitoba are ready to embrace. And so even if we can just get the dominant parties to listen to us more and put some of our good ideas into practice, that would be wonderful. Of course, we've got a lot to cover today, but let's kind of follow up a little bit more on climate change, the climate crisis, that sort of things. So for the Green Party, what sort of policies and things would you implement or look at? So for a lot of people, maybe they are concerned about the climate but, you know, sometimes maybe they hear very extreme radical ideas and they're like, whoa, that's going to completely change my whole life and everything like that. I don't know how that's going to affect, um, you know, what sort of policy or things can you put in place that is not going to hurt the economy, like in terms of just completely throwing it out of whack? Uh, 
and just kind of getting people on board while kind of moving forward, sort of. Well, I think what it's important for folks to understand is that we can't have environmental justice without social justice. They are intimately inter interconnected. We are part of the biology that we are damaging by our current extractive, destructive practices. So we need to get away from our, our chemical dependence on fossil fuels. So we need to be able to heat our homes and build our homes. So rather than I rather than look at this as a challenge to our economy, this is a wonderful opportunity for our economy. And the Green Party frames our number one issue is green jobs for the future. And that means massive mobilization of uh, younger people, people who want to retrain, people who want to, we want to move people away from the um, extractive resources of the fossil fuel industry, but we understand there's a lot of people in Manitoba that make money from that process. So that we need to not only change how we're heating our homes, for example, and subsidize moving away from natural gas. So a very concrete example is no new homes should be built that aren't energy efficient, that are dependent on natural gas. Right now we have to be moving towards geothermal and air exchange, heat exchange um, methods that, so the government needs to invest massively. So what we're proposing is for this massive investment in green jobs to help us move away from our current extractive economy to a carbon neutral economy and doing this through subsidizing jobs, subsidizing home, you know, housing and homes being heated in a way that doesn't bleed our bank accounts dry. At the same time, improving efficiency. We, we have such a head start with the way that our electricity is more carbon neutral than most, but we need to at the same time improve the efficiency for Manitoba Hydro. Also, the fact that we have a crown corporation providing our electricity is a great boon to Manitoba. So we see Manitoba positioned to be the leaders in Canada if we had the political will to see that leadership opportunity. So take out green bonds. We estimate there's over $1.7 trillion looking to be invested in this green transition. So sell green bonds in Manitoba to finance this because we want to be responsible fiscally as well as environmentally, as well as socially. And we see no conflict between this. Manitoba and Canada are rich and rich in resources, and there is no need for us to have the levels of poverty that we currently have. So in addition to these green jobs to mobilize to address the climate emergency, a basic income guarantee for everyone, not just for seniors, which we're moving towards, but a basic income guarantee. So our first pillar, green jobs to address the climate emergency. Our second, a basic income guarantee. And having that solid, basic income from which you can add, I mean, right now, if someone who is receiving disability benefits, their income is tied to their disability benefits, if they get a contract or get work, they're taxed at 85% of what they make. So that has to change. So we encourage people to fill the roles that they can in society because we need this mass mobilization. We need everybody and every you know, immigrant that wants to come, we can, as long as we can, mobilize folks to build the housing that we need, social housing as well as private housing. It's estimated the Right to Housing Group has taught me a thousand social housing units need to be made, and we need to upgrade all the ones we've got. What a great opportunity to ensure there to the building codes that we need to have to be carbon neutral. So, employ these folks, retrofitting the construction industry, retrofitting agriculture, retrofitting transportation, retrofitting manufacturing. Our vision is massive mobilization funded by green bonds, working more collegially with the federal government because there's a lot of subsidies sitting on the table from the federal government because our provincial government is not playing nice with the feds. Just as I'm sure your listeners are hearing, there's so much blaming and attacking going on throughout this campaign. 
The Green Party does not believe in slinging mud. We're into soil conservation. So we believe we need to come to the table, all of the different parties, all of the different perspectives, and put our best ideas forward and work together. Let's move away from this hierarchical, colonial system that has us thinking, I'm better than you're better, than we're better, than they're better, and then those are others. And That's old. That's done. We're in this together. We all matter. We all need to be at the table with the voice. First Nations, newcomer Canadians, uh, you know, Métis, uh, business, um, educational institutions, everyone, all need to be at the table. And this, this parleying back and forth or, or the party politics, the partisan poly, party politics, that's why one of our third platforms with the Green Party is make every vote count. We need to move away from first past the post democracy to proportional representation. This bickering, this uh, between the parties actually turns people off. There's all kinds of research that shows it's directly connected to our low voter turnout. People don't want to be part of the, you know, the mudslinging game. They want answers. They want collegial dialogue. And so that's what a green MLA from Mosley will be promoting. I think, and sometimes just, you know, the way the First Nations have healing circles, I feel like our government needs healing circles, both between the parties and in the bureaucracy. We've lost so many civil servants in the last 30 years that were that were really stabilizing and ensuring that the government was in touch with what with people's needs and communities' needs. But that kind of cutting has led to the situation we find ourselves in now, where there's a great lack of housing, there's a great lack of um, adequate teachers in our classroom, our education is suffering, and our health care is suffering. So everywhere you look, a massive investment in jobs can make a difference. But we don't just invest in the jobs the way they are now. We believe in something called citizen citizen uh, assemblies, where you take the people who have the frontline experience and you create a, a discussion group where you listen and you get the guidance. How do you make your job more green? How do we move in your circumstance? And this is this is by listening to that, we can ensure that every position is contributing to our carbon neutral goals because we have to reduce our emissions by 9% every year until to, to meet our 2030 goals. And what, what the dominant parties are putting forth does not do that. Mm -hmm. So we need to improve our accountability to each other and to our communities in order to meet these important goals. So we think that those, those, those three pillars will all have an impact on health care. So by ensuring a basic income guarantee that helps us deal with uh, some of the, the stress of poverty, which will, um, by employ in ensuring the, the jobs are increased, then we'll have enough people working that right away also reduces poverty stress and having a good job being able to eat properly being able to or or a basic income guarantee just ensuring that you have a, the ability to eat fruits and vegetables those are the main things that we need to eat but so much screen time and so much advertising people are forgetting that they can't just eat for pleasure. They need to eat for health, for their brain function, for their body function. But currently, there's too high a percentage of the population that are not food secure. So we see by addressing these two, that the green jobs include local production for local consumption of food, that we will be preventative uh, in, in ensuring that we're preventing health issues and that will take some of the stress away along with the basic income guarantee and then the longer term is the making every vote count ensuring that there are there's more diversity on the ballot that more different types of politicians are elected so it's not just the two this ping pong ndp conservative ndp conservative ndp conservative with the liberals and the greens saying hey what about us we're here too <laughs> we're here too you know i'm not even included in the leadership 
debate because we don't have a sitting MLA. Well, how can we get a sitting MLA if you exclude parties that don't have sitting MLAs? We want diversity. It's important. Like I come from a background in agriculture. I know how important diversity is in the soil, in our cropping systems, in our bioregions, in our watersheds. Diversity is the stability that has allowed us to evolve to the point where we are now, where we're destroying our environment. So we need to pull back from that intelligently and say, oops, we stepped a little too far along the road of industrialization. We can't quit pumping out all of this carbon and all of this methane. And natural gas is mostly methane. So let's retrofit our social housing. Let's retrofit our existing housing stock off of natural gas, into geothermal, into air uh, or geo uh, heat exchangers. Let's subsidize that. Not, I mean, yes, some of the parties are talking about doing that to a certain extent. It needs to be much larger on a much larger scale. You covered a lot there, and I definitely want to touch on some of the other areas, such as uh, immigration, healthcare, that sort of stuff. Um, but in... Uh, um, when you were talking there, you're mentioning, you know, First Nations and stuff. Um, First Nations, um, uh, Inuit, and Métis, oftentimes policies or development, they're usually the first affected by those, whether that is not access to clean water, um, forestry practices, mining practices, uh, hydro, that sort of thing. What sort of role do indigenous communities have in the Green Party? What sort of connection or conversations do you have with them? Because a lot of decisions yeah. are going to affect them directly or indirectly. Well, for one thing, we have not been employing free, prior, and informed consent. So the government rams projects through without our First Nations being at the table. I just need to step back a bit and let you know that my father was an actor and a singer. And so early in my childhood, he played roles where our horses, I grew up on a horse ranch, our horses were used in the filming of making a movie about Governor Simpson. And there were a lot of First Nation actors actors. So I have been around First Nations people since I was a child, hearing the stories of their experience. My dad did a show called Death of a Nobody, which tells the horrendous story of a First Nations man being kicked to death by seven white men in Saskatchewan. So when you have that kind of childhood awareness of a genocide happening around you, it changes your worldview. And so this is one of the reasons why I've lived on the land without using Manitoba hydropower, because I object to the way the First Nations communities have been treated by Manitoba hydro. I'm glad we've got more green uh, electricity for folks. I personally did want to be part of it, so I've been on solar and wind for the last 40 years of my life in solidarity with the First Nations people because... Norway House, a whole series of their, their fisheries, their lives are being negatively impacted by the erosion caused by treating Lake Winnipeg like it's just a catchment basin for Manitoba Hydro. We are intelligent enough to find a way to manage our hydroelectricity without damaging Lake Winnipeg, without damaging the livelihoods of the people that are dependent. So we need to honor the hydro treaties. We need to honor all our treaties. And having been aware of this from a very young time, I certainly support the work of the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs. Kathy Merrick is a wonderful chief, as are the other chiefs working together, but they have not been consulted early enough on many projects. They're not being listened to. And so I just say we have to change the way we're working in this hierarchical politics of policy and ensure everybody is at the table all the way through, not just a cursory, you know, here's what we're going to do, yes or no. Like, it's, it, it, it's lip service. It's not free, prior, and informed consent. So we need to have more consultation services, as I say, citizens' assemblies, so that we're able to access the resources to benefit everyone. So how do you want to be support? How does your First Nations want to be involved in this? Do you want to have your say on how we evaluate it? Do you want to be, in, of course, more royalties? More you know, There's many discussions going on right now that are too slow because government 
uh, employees and ministers do not know the, our history. So we need to enforce the truth and reconciliation actions, those 94 points of action. We've only done like two or three of them. Everybody needs to be trained on what those are and why they're important. Everybody needs to be trained. Missing, murdered, and indigenous, indigenous women and girls and two-spirited, QAI, that Though they, what are they? They've got 243 or 241 recommendations. Those need to be trained to all bureaucrats and all politicians, so that we know what it means to make the changes. So that this kind of oppression and murder does not continue. So that basic training of those two, we've. In so many areas, the research has been done. There has been consultation. Let's listen to what we've been told and implement it. So that's what I see needs to happen, is that there needs to be more education of everybody around the table about how First Nations have been included. That's the next excluded. That's the next step from land acknowledgements. Let's, I'm very pleased to see so many at the start of almost everything acknowledging we're on Treaty 1 land or that the Green Party Im impacts all of the treaties in Manitoba, 1 to 5 plus the treaty addendums, plus 10, plus the hydro treaties. We're all treaty people in Manitoba, but not everybody knows that. But we should all consider ourselves treaty people. So that is a little bit of my background and my connection. So I have, of course, uh, in my circle of, of friends and supporters, many folks who understand what's going on. And I just constantly try to listen and, and be open and, and hear and, and look for opportunities to ensure that all the voices are coming to the table. What sort of role and um, policies would you have in place for immigrants and immigration. Part of a growing Manitoba is, you know, helping First Nations community, helping those who were born here and live here, and then providing spaces and opportunities for immigration. Immigration okay. continues to be a major driving force here in Canada and uh, Manitoba. So yeah, you know, a lot of people who first arrive in Manitoba, they see the challenges that we're facing here and they decide to take the chances in another province. How do we attract people here to Manitoba? And how do we get them to stay to want to build their lives here and help support and grow the economy and grow the province? Well, just as we just had to take a bunch of refugees from the Northwest Territories because of climate uh, and a climate emergency and the, and the fires there, there are going to be increased number of climate refugees. And so not only will we have to make space for, for those folks that need to be here, but for the folks that, that are escaping the wars that are happening or that just are ready to start a new life in, in Manitoba. Manitoba. I think the issues around one of the things that frightens people that I'm asked the most is why is there so much violence in Manitoba? Why is there so much crime? Again, that is the history of the residential school system, the lack of economic development on reserves, the lack of appropriate cultural education. Um, and I think in order for us to continue to welcome newcomers at an increased rate, which will be necessary, we have to address the housing stock. We don't want to welcome people where we don't have a, 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 a warm in winter and cool in summer place for them to live. So our policies about retrofitting our existing housing stock and increasing the, you know, the social housing, affordable housing can be really a slippery term because it's affordable housing if you're building a, a $500,000 home in a community that has million and a half dollar homes. And I understand that's happening right now. That's not what we mean by affordable housing. So what we mean affordable housing is for what's the average Manitoban earn? Like I think it's 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 down forty five, forty seven thousand dollars or something. So we need a house that's uh, affordable housing that's less 
than uh, it, you know that that's reachable for for folks with normal jobs. So this this retrofitting of our housing stock and increasing social housing, increasing available affording housing, affordable housing, is intimately connected with our ability to welcome newcomer Canadians to Manitoba. But I think if we have a basic income guarantee, that will really help folks get on their feet until they are able to find where they fit in our economy and where their particular talents or their training fits in. I think it's important that we look at streamlining recognizing training from other countries. The bureaucratic and retraining hoops that people have to jump through are so hierarchical and disrespectful. Why are we not respecting training in, from other countries? So that's an issue that needs to be addressed as well. Increased training to meet the needs so that newcomer Canadians can get the training they need to work in whatever field they want to, to work in. We need more social community supports that are culturally appropriate First Nations where that's appropriate, newcomer Canadians where that's appropriate. Folks need to be met where they are, and we don't have the social community supports to do that, but we have a wonderful network of schools and community centres that are closed too much of the time. We, the Green Party envisions our, our schools and our community centres open 24-7 and staffed to meet the needs of their communities, listening to the people in their communities of what do you need in your newcomer experience, what do you need in your First Nations experience, Cha truly celebrating the diversity that we know comes from uh, a, 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 a welcoming the people that want to be here into our communities in a way that enriches us all. So this is, this is the vision of the Green Party of Manitoba. More investment in our communities at every level to meet our greenhouse gas emission targets at the same time as meeting our social justice targets. Just to add in some context, when we're looking at a job bank and the wages here in Manitoba, for general laborers and stuff like that, it's approximately 15 to 20-ish dollars. And I think for, for things like support workers for people with disabilities or for personal care supports, those need to be minimum $20, $25 an hour because that is key work that requires a, a, quite a skill set and a great deal of compassion. So I really see lifting the minimum minimum wage, lifting what people on frontline workers receive so that they are livable wages. And this can all be done through sale of green bonds and a reorganization of who we subsidize. Right now, billions of dollars are spent annually in Manitoba subsidizing profitable corporations that do not need those subsidies. We need to redirect those corporate subsidies to our uh, our goals for both environmental justice and social justice. So a lot of the policies that you've been mentioning are going to directly or indirectly affect lots of these different topics that we're talking about, whether that is climate change, providing jobs, uh, which will affect crime rates and stuff like that, and healthcare, immigration. To go a little bit more into healthcare, uh, people are waiting a long time to see a physician or see a doctor or even people trying to get a family doctor for the first time. There is a long waiting list. And a lot of our healthcare workers, we're seeing them leave. We're seeing them They're quit. burnt out. How do we change the system in place in order to retain healthcare workers and improve the services there? And then from there, we can talk a little bit about addiction and stuff like that, because I feel like those two are kind of tied Very together. Very connected. Okay, so in terms of burnout, this is the, the Green Jobs Initiative, our number one green jobs for climate, you know, climate emergency and for our future. Let's ask them, what, how could we change your job so that it's less stressful, so that your needs are met, so that we're not just raising what they're paid to a uh, a, a, a suitable level. You know, one of the parties has been bragging about raising personal care attendance rates to $19 an hour. That's still not enough to live on. It's got to go up 20, 23, 25, not in three years and in five years, but in 2024. We need to make those changes so that people are paid a livable wage, that they can live, they can live in a good place. What can we change in their jobs so they're not burnt out? And that is increase, increasing the staffing rates so that 
that's the training. We can't increase hiring people unless we train them. So massive investment in training, the change of greater recognition of foreign qualifications. You know, like let's look at the institutions where people were trained. Let's look at the training that they have and not have them have to start all over again. That's such a waste of resources. We are living in a time when resources must be cherished and not wasted. So training more people, also more transparency. You talk about waiting lists, governments, human beings, need to be accountable to one another. And when you make our systems more transparent, then we can see, here is what we're going to do. This is how long this is taking. What are the bottlenecks? How can we change it? So improve transparency, and that improves accountability. And I think that that will help us reduce our waiting lists. So through that, through all of those, you can see how they're all inter interconnected. But also then, while folks are training, and getting the training they need, that's where the basic income guarantee is. In the long term, we would see all training, all education, like most other northern Nordic countries, should be free. You know, we see Canada should follow more along the lines of what Denmark, Sweden, Norway are doing, that you have free education. If someone's putting in all the effort to be trained, you make sure that they don't leave it with a huge debt. So we're working towards that. But in the meantime, massive investment in training, uh, investment in increasing living wages, subsidizing of the building of homes to meet energy efficiency standards, subsidizing of all transition away from methane. So at the same time, we look at this massive change in society as a wonderful opportunity to fix our social problems and address the need to be welcoming to more of the Earth's populations because of the impacts of climate change. And I believe addressing these, the pressure on our healthcare system and the pressure caused by poverty will have a long way to improving mental health supports and addiction supports and reducing the stress of life in 2023. That's why there, I think our, our addiction rates are so high right now. It's been very stressful to be alive. And some of us are more privileged than others to have been taught stress management or like myself, to be able to live on the land. Being close to nature heals us all. And so part of this has to be supporting the connection between people who are healing and the natural world to ensure the healing happens more deeply and more quickly. And there are a lot of programs in place that are working towards that, that require more funding, more support, more staff, more training for staff. So I see those, those green jobs include trauma intervention workers. Let's remove from the police what are not police duties. Let's have have trauma support workers. Let's have mental health workers. My family personally has been impacted by addictions and mental health issues. And the first time my father had a psychotic break, there were seven RCMP cruisers at our home. It was extremely traumatic for our whole family. Those were not, was not the kind of intervention that someone having a mental health break needed. And that's why we have so many people dying in police care. It's not fair to the people who serve as our police to be forcing them to deal with such a wide range of situations without adequate training. So I believe compassion is needed in all our systems, all the way around. We have to move away from blaming, move away from a negative framework that's fear-based to how do we support folks in uh, addressing the change of their jobs to being more green and more compassionate. This is the basis of our values, health, ecology, fairness, and care, which are the Green Party values. So we've heard a lot about the Green Party today. What sort of message would you like to leave with the residents of Manitoba as we're heading into Election Day? Well, I would like to say I'm very proud of the work that we've done on our website and our policies. We have a small green team, but they're very dedicated. So I would ask the people of Manitoba to think green and vote Janine and her team. Advanced polling is open until September 30th, with Election Day October 3rd. Make sure you go out and vote. With You Multicultural, I'm Ryan Funk.